As you find your seats, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, uh, we start a new sermon series next week. Uh, we finished one up last week, so here on this Labor Day weekend, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you there in the pew. Uh, you could use that, and also the words will be on the screen for you as well. So happy Labor Day weekend. We know what it means that Labor Day weekend's here, right? Football is back. Yahoo. Uh, love that reality. Uh, we also know that kind of summer's over. Cooler weather is here. Hopefully cooler weather is coming. But I got to tell you, growing up uh, where I did, um, Labor Day weekend was the most depressing weekend of the entire year. I mean, it really was. And I'll tell you why it was the most depressing, because it meant summer is over. Uh, it meant school is about to start. I mean, up there in the Northeast, uh, they don't start until September. And so as our family had a small little cottage on one of the Finger Lakes in upstate New York, uh, Labor Day weekend meant that everybody brought their docks in. And it was depressing. It's like everything's over, right? Everybody brought their boats in. And then all the friends that you had in that little community you had to say goodbye. I said, I'll see you next year. And just, it felt like I'll see you forever away uh, and said goodbye. So the Labor Day weekend, completely depressing. Uh, it certainly has changed, uh, again, the joy of football, the joy of other things. But how did we get to this Labor Day weekend celebration anyway? Do you know the first uh, celebration for Labor Day was celebrated on Tuesday, September 5th, 1882. Complete rookie mistake having it on Tuesday, right? I mean, what a rookie mistake. You gotta have it on Monday, so you have a three-day weekend. Uh, so, hey, it's okay, they had the first one. And why do we have Labor Day? Well, Labor Day was to celebrate the American worker, to celebrate the American ingenuity, the American work ethic. And so what they wanna do? give you a day of rest as they celebrated the American work ethic. Let's give them a day of rest. Well, according to God's word, you were, you and I were both created to work as we are created in God's image. There's no greater worker than God. But we're not only created to work. Watch this. God commands us to rest. I mean, rest is so important. It's going to be one of his 10 commandments uh, that we are to find our rest in him. God's word is going to tell us how we are to work, uh, not just whistle while we work, but we are ultimately to work for God's glory. No matter what you do, whether you're a doctor, lawyer, teacher, house, uh, wife, husband, whatever you are, we are to work for God's glory, to participate in God's work. I mean, church, that's something we try to strive in our sermon series, Missio Day. Let us join God in what he is doing. So ultimately, that is what we do. We join God in his work. God's word also tells us that we are to rest, to participate in God's rest. And basically, that means the finished work of Christ and what that means for us to rest in him. God has commanded us that one day in seven should be set apart for worship and rest. And I think that the culture today has completely forgotten what that looks like. But God in his wisdom is doing this. He's saying, listen, I've created you in my image. I worked for six days, took one day to rest. Why? Was God tired? Heavens, no. He wanted to separate his work from his being, right? He wanted us to worship him for what he has done and for who he is. And he wants us to separate ourselves from our work and from who we are. And he wants us to develop a rhythm, a rhythm in life of work and rest. I think it's a rhythm that we find hard to find. I think as Americans, we find very hard to find oftentimes. Uh, a lot of us love to work and a lot of us have a hard time resting. A lot of times you think you rest. Uh, how many of you had a summer vacation uh, this year, were you able to get away, put your feet up, have a little bit of vacation? Uh, vacation is supposed to give rest to our bodies, to our minds. But what in the world could give rest to our souls? That's where we are this morning. Jesus is going to say to us, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And he says, and I'm going to give you rest. And not just rest for your body and your mind. I'm going to give you rest for your souls. 
So this Sunday, this Labor Day weekend, we're going to look to the rest that Jesus gives us, this rest of our souls. And so there are four things we're going to look at. We're going to look at the invitation uh, to rest. We're going to look at the need to rest. We're going to look at the source of rest. And then lastly, the requirements of rest. Again, we're going to pick up the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, just reading verses 28 through 30. Uh, let's be mindful. This is God's holy and errant word. He's never going to lead us astray. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we're so grateful on this Labor Day weekend that your word tells us of Jesus' words, of Jesus' invitation to come, to come and find rest for our souls. God, as we live each day in this broken world with our broken lives, oh, how we long for rest. We're weary. We're a weary people physically, mentally, spiritually. Oh, God, we need rest, rest that only you can provide. So, God, come and teach us. Come and be teacher. Come and speak through a broken sinner like me. Oh, God, give us ears to hear your voice and God, give us minds that would understand your word and give us hearts that would embrace your truth. And God, be with your people so powerfully that you would give us feet that would walk out of here in a manner worthy of your name. Oh God, the things that I say that are just my opinion are wrong. May those things fall away and be forgotten quickly. But God, the things that are said that contain the good news of the gospel, oh Lord, use those things to shape us and to make us Use those things to bring rest to our souls. And we pray this in Christ's matchless name. Amen. The first thing we see is this amazing, gracious invitation. The invitation of rest. Jesus himself invites us. He says, come, come to me. Uh, it kind of echoes the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 55 will say this. Come to me, all you who are thirsty. I mean, who here isn't thirsty? Isn't thirst a condition of being human? Isn't that something we all thirst, long, a longing? It comes since sin entered the world, since we were separated from God. And we've, since that time, we've all been thirsty. We've all been longing. We've all been hungering for more. We all have developed a thirst that only God can quench but we're such knuckleheads, we try to get it quenched in any way the world offers. And the quenching of our thirst only comes from our God who's able to quench even our souls. And he's going to say, hey, come to me. Come to me. It's amazing. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, way back in the 400s, uh, wrote a book called The Confessions. And he nailed it when he says this. He says, our hearts are restless, are they not? Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God and their rest in you. I mean, that's the truth of all of us. All of us are longing. All of us are, are, are wanting. All of us are thirsty. And Augustine nailed it. He says, they're going to be forever restless. Our hearts are going to be forever restless until we find our rest in you. And Jesus is the one who graciously says, come, come. So this week I went to Publix. Uh, I was really glad that when I got in the express line, uh, there was only one person in front of me. Uh, much to my chagrin, although the sign says 10 items or less, clearly she had more than 10 items. A little bit irritated, kind of looking at the sign, like, <clears throat> you know, less than 10 items here, you know. And then it got worse because she wanted to know the price of every item. How much is this? 250 okay. How much is this? I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, then there was one, how much is this? Oh, it's too much. Put that away. 
Uh, and then it came to the time to pay. And of course, her payment wasn't working, right? It took a couple of times. And so your pastor being a loving, compassionate guy, a guy who just says, here, let me take care of that. You know, no, I was like so frustrated that she's in the checkout line with 10 and less and clogging it up. And I'm just like, Lord, forgive me. I mean, my attitude. Forgive the arrogance. Forgive, forgive the fact that I, here I am standing in judgment of this woman. And, you know, it just, it just revealed to me that, that I was inconvenienced because of somebody having more than 10 items in the checkout line. I was inconvenienced for somebody that was worried that she couldn't afford paying it that asked for uh, how much did each one of these cost. I just said, Lord, forgive me. I'm such a sinner. I'm so impatient. I'm so judgmental. And aren't you glad that that's not the way God treats us? I mean, that, that's not the way he treats us. He doesn't, listen, God is almighty. God is creator of all things. God is sustainer of all things. Wouldn't you think he would despise weakness? But he doesn't. I mean, I know that I often despise my weakness, I despise my weakness and the weakness of others, but that's not our God. He's the Almighty One, and yet He's the one who says, come to me. And here's the requirement. You are weary. You are burdened. You are needy. God does not uh, despise our weakness. God is not impatient with our humanness. How many of you are just impatient with being human? I mean, how many of you who are just cursing yourself out because you can't find your phone again? Because of the fact that you, uh, like me, uh, you're broken, uh, you're a knucklehead, you're prone to wander, and here's the reality, God does not despise our humanness. As a matter of fact, Jesus would take it on. It's incredible. And God isn't frustrated with our neediness. Again, I know that that hits a chord with many of us. Many of us we don't want to be needy, right? We want to be self-sufficient. We're Americans. We want to have our ducks in a row. We want to have it all together. Neediness, it's a sign of weakness, and we despise it. But that's not our God. Because the reality is of every one of us is that we are weak and needy, and he invites us. He calls us to come to him. Jesus specifically calls those who are weary and heavy burdened. Because those of us who are too busy, those of us who are too arrogant, those of us who are too self-sufficient, we will not hear that call. And yet here he says, those of you who are just worn out, uh, those of you who are just heavy laden and burdened, come to me for rest. Anybody weary? Anybody heavy burdened? Isn't it a great, amazing invitation? Come to me. So then we see this need for rest. Uh, Jesus uh, is going to offer us in the Gospels not just rest for our minds and our bodies, that's great, but rest for our souls. This is, this is better than a good night's sleep after a long day of work, all right? Uh, and remember, work isn't evil. Um, work isn't evil. We were created in God's image to work. There's never been a greater worker. Have you seen his creation that he speaks it into existence? Work isn't e uh, uh, evil, but ever since Sin entered the world, work has become a burden. Has it not? I love the fact he tells us that. He tells us, listen, now work is going to become by the sweat of your brow. Now you're going to have thorns and thistles that grow up all around what you do. Isn't it frustrating? Isn't it frustrating even on your best day and all the things you do, you still have someone mess it up? You still have things that just don't add up? I mean, it's still so frustrating. I mean, God told us it's a part of the fall. Blame Adam and Eve. What were they thinking? And now labor is painful, work is the sweat of our brows. Um, and now because of our sinfulness and our brokenness, we work to obtain the wrong things. We work for the wrong reasons. Uh, work isn't as satisfying as it should be. And since that sin has entered the picture, you know what we're really ultimately working for apart from him? We're working to try to find God. We're working to try to find ourselves. Remember, God has created us for something more than just working for a living, more than just working for the weekend. Uh, but in our sinfulness, we often work to try to find our significance. I think it's very interesting in Japan um, when they exchange business cards. Uh, Meishi, I think, is the name of that. Is that right, Taylor? Meishi is a business card. Got it right. 
when they exchange Macy business cards, they look to see who has the better title, right? And whoever's got the better title, that other person bows lower, you know? Oh, you are more significant I am. You know, I'm a, I'm a manager, but you're the regional manager. Uh, oftentimes, we may not culturally bow to one another, but don't we often work for our significance? I mean, don't we often work uh, to try to make sure we can prove ourselves? Maybe we're working to try to find peace. I mean, the things that we can buy that might bring peace. Oftentimes, we work trying to find peace within our own skin. How's that working for you? Guarantee it's not going to work. Uh, we've been working to find, find, find our place in this world. I mean, where, where do I fit in? Am I respected? I remember back in 1992, I left the business world. The stock market went right in the toilets. No, they didn't care that I left the business world. But I left that, and I became a youth director. And people are like, you, you're what? You're, 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 you're hanging out with kids? What, what, what else do you do all week? I mean, so you just organize games for kids all week? I mean, I remember feeling so insignificant in the world's eyes. I mean, but I remember that 85% of the people who come to Christ do so by the age of 18. I felt like I was on the front line of the kingdom. And yet oftentimes in work, when you realize, hey, what do you do? Isn't it interesting how what we often ask one another, not who you are, but what do you do? It's oftentimes we live in a culture that wants to identify us by our work and our significance with our work. But really, we just need rest. And only in him can we find that rest. That's thirdly, the source of rest. Jesus is the only source of rest for our souls. Two things that Jesus has when he says to us, come to me, those of you who are weary, burdened, I will give you rest, rest to your souls. There's two things that Jesus has that he has the power and the authority to do that. That's one thing is that. Jesus has the authority, he has the power to give us rest, even rest to our souls. But the second thing I think is even more amazing is Jesus gives us the accessibility. In Christ Jesus, he's accessible to all of us. Be accessible to find rest for our soul. So he and he alone is the source of our rest. We know that scripture, uh, at the end of the gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is gathered with his disciples right before he ascended and he gives us the great commission, he says to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I mean, this is God's only begotten son. He had so much authority already. And now conquering death. And now having gone through the cross and living again, all authority, the authority over life and death, over the law, it's been given to him. All that authority that he has, all that power, even over death, he says, I want to give you all that to give you rest. And Jesus and Jesus' hands alone is life. And in Jesus and Jesus' hands alone is rest. And in Jesus and Jesus alone is our way to find the Father. And listen, Augustine was right. Our hearts will forever wander. They will forever be restless until they find the Father, until we find our rest in you. And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And finding the Father will bring us the rest we long for. Have you been in that terribly awkward moment in a store like Walmart to see a lost child? Is there anything like more painful than watching a panic of a child that's lost. Or maybe on the opposite side, a, parent, a panic of a parent who's lost their child, right? I mean, there's, there's no rest until there's a reunion, right? There's no rest until reunion. Uh, that's just the reality, until they find their father. And here's the beautiful thing about Christianity. Jesus has helped us find the father. I mean, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, and he didn't miss one of us. His work was complete. Through his life and fulfilling the law and requirements of a holy God, through his death and absorbing God's wrath for sinners and knuckleheads like us, through his resurrection, defeating death, Jesus was able to hang on the cross and say the words, it is finished. I mean, so what, what is finished? The way to the Father is finished. The law is fulfilled. There's no condemnation for knuckleheads because in Christ Jesus, I filled it. The wrath of God, because of our sin and our brokenness, it's been absorbed. 
I was separated from God so you and I could be brought in. Death has been defeated. It is finished. Rest. You can find your way home. You'll find the Father's delight in his Son. You're going to have the rest for your soul, that you know your sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. You're filled with his Spirit. You're, you're adopted into his family. I mean, that's what he's saying. Are you, are you thirsty? Are, are you heavy laden, burdened? Come to me. I'm the way to the Father. I'm the way home. I'm the way to rest. He and he alone is the source of rest. But there's not just the source. I love this. There's also the accessibility. So you have in Jesus the power and the authority, but you also have the low and meek and the accessibility. He says this in the passage, hey, I'm gentle. I'm lowly in heart. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is, 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 is light. I mean, again, think of a yoke. Uh, think of a yoke uh, on, on an ox or something like that uh, that you put over someone to, to do the plowing. But here's the interesting thing. In that time, in rabbinic time, uh, the rabbis would have a yoke. They would have their teaching. This is my understanding of the law. This is my teaching. His dis dis disciples that follow a certain rabbi would put the yoke on of that rabbi. And so Jesus is saying, hey, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why? Because what God requires of you, I've done for you. Because of the law that was a burden to you, I fulfilled. Because the death that separated you from me, from my father, I have defeated. See, my yoke is easy. My, my, my burden is, is light. And only Jesus can have that accessibility. He is the source of the rest and the rest of our souls. And he is accessible to all of us. Listen, the reality is this, is there's a difference between numbing or medicating our souls and having our souls find rest. Is it not true? And we're going to numb our souls. We're going to numb our lives from the pain, from something. And sometimes we get addicted to those things. But Jesus says, that's temporary. I could give you eternal rest. You know, that child at Walmart, you could try to make them feel better by giving them a toy or a treat. And it might numb the pain for a little bit. But there's this ache for the father, or the ache for the mother, that only can be taken away by being reunited. That's who we are in Christ. So what's the requirement of rest? We must take on Jesus' yoke and find the rest that he offers. You know what this means? we got to bend our necks and surrender to him. I mean, that's what it means to put on his yoke. We, we, we bend our necks. We, we, we surrender. We see, say, you're Lord, you're king. We take off the yoke of our own choosing. Jesus' yoke is easy, but watch this. And his burden is light, but taking off our yoke? Oh my gosh, is that incredibly difficult? I mean, we, we, we love, we want to be king. We want to be the center of the universe. We want it all. But Jesus is saying, come to me and, and take my yoke, but bend your neck. Find rest for your soul. How do, how's he saying? Because here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I want to be your identity. I, I want to be your security. Um, I want you to surrender to me. And I'm not going to treat you like a slave. I'm going to treat you like a son. I'm going to give you life and life abundantly. You're going to find that when you deny yourself and you pick up your cross, you're going to, you're going to find life. And when you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find life. I mean, that's the crazy upside-down gospel. Yes, his yoke is easy. Yes, his burden is, 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 is light. But we have to come to him, and the requirements is put his yoke upon us. We must be okay with him being in control. We must be okay with God being responsible for the outcome of our life, not us. We must be okay that our work is never finished, but God will one day finish it. We must have not our work as our own identity. We must have God as our identity. You know, all of us, church, we have the privilege of wearing the yoke of Christ before we wear the crown of Christ. And that's what he says to us. Hey, are you weary? Are you burdened? He doesn't say pull yourself up by the bootstraps. He doesn't say work a little darn harder. Get a little better. He says just come to me. 
Come to me. Come and surrender and find life and life abundantly. And here's the amazing good news of the gospel. Jesus put on the yoke of our own nature. He put on the yoke of us. He became a man and dwelt among us so he could seek and save us. He put on the yoke of God's law that none of us could keep and all of us were tripping over. He says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to magnify it, to fulfill it. He was born under the law to free us from the curse of the law. He put on the yoke of our sin. He would become sin on the cross so that we could become the righteousness of God. Think of it this way. Jesus came to this broken world to be lost in the Walmart of this world and to experience the absolute hell of being separated from his Father. The tormenting torture of having to cry out and say, my God, my God, where are you? I'm lost. God, where are you? How could you leave me? God, and there he was left alone on the cross so that we could be found. He was lost so we could be found. Now in Jesus, we find our rest for our souls. Have you bent your neck? Have you put on the yoke of Christ Jesus? There's no rest until you do, until you surrender your life to him. Jesus gave us a meal to remind us of the rest of our souls. It's a costly meal. It would cost him his life for us to find that meal. You'll never find a more costly meal than this. But it's also a meal that says, the work is done. I've made it home, and so will you. Stop trying to work on your own. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. Rest for your souls. Amen? Let's pray. Now, Father God, all of us have a thirst and a longing that only you can quench. And God, the truth is, in our sinfulness, we run to anything that we think will quench us. We drink deeply from the chalice the world offers us, only to be more numb and addicted, but it leaves us wanting. It leaves us longing. And Jesus, I thank you for the reality that you would step into this broken world and that you would come to seek and to save us. And so we could find our way home, that we could find the Father. All of us are lost in the Walmart of this world. And the thought that you would be lost on the cross so that we could be found is so profoundly good news. Jesus, you have the authority to give us rest of our souls. Jesus, you have the accessibility for us to find rest for our souls. And Jesus, you tell us that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Oh God, may you help us to bow to you as King of kings and Lord of lords, to wear your yoke so we can make our way home, so that we can have rest and rest for our souls. Jesus, thank you in your wisdom. You gave your disciples and us a meal to remember, to remember that the work is finished so that we can rest, a meal to long for, look forward to the rest that's to come when there's no more striving, no more tears, and we found our way home. Oh God, use this meal tangibly to tell us you love us, to remind us that we belong, and to bring rest to our souls. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.